A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Hello, I'm Tim Farron and welcome to the show which delves into the mucky business of politics through the eyes of Christians. You might think politics is tainted by compromise and sin. And well, of course, you would be right. But then again, so is everything else. And I think we should be praying in an informed way for our brothers and sisters who operate in and around the world of politics. Today, we're going to be joined by a friend of the show, Cara Bentley. Cara previously produced this podcast and now works as a broadcast journalist at the Wireless Group, where she can be heard reading the news on stations such as Times Radio and Talk Radio. We're going to spend some time reflecting on what's been a whirlwind 2022. But first, how are you feeling as Christmas approaches? It seems we are living in dark times. After years of widening political and cultural divisions and then a pandemic, we were maybe hoping for some respite, a time of peace, time to breathe. But in 2022, we have seen war in Europe, chaos in government, spiralling poverty, collapsing public services and seemingly no end in sight. This year, many people will not be focused on the glitter and magic of the Christmas season. Instead, they will be worrying about how they're going to buy presents for their children, how they will be able to afford to cook Christmas dinner, how they'll heat their homes. Isaiah 9 was written centuries before the birth of Christ. These words will be read at carol services across the nation in the coming weeks. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now, this prophecy is not vague spirituality. It is a tangible hope for those who are trudging through deep darkness. But can we convince one another that this is truly relevant to the here and now? That first Christmas was full of wonder and mystery. The one who flung stars into space entered humanity as a tiny, helpless baby. But the nativity story is also full of angels telling people not to be afraid, not to panic at the strange things that were happening. As I always try to emphasize on this show, God wants us to care deeply about our world because he does. Jesus did not float around Judea untroubled and undisturbed. No, he got his hands dirty and his heart broken on our behalf. At the same time, in the face of today's darkness, we are reminded not to panic. Jesus tells his disciples in John 16 that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. These words point back to that famous passage in Isaiah, which goes on to say, to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Our earthly government are full of flawed human beings who make mistakes. But Psalm 103 tells us the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all, even if it doesn't look like it. Whatever challenges we are facing personally and as a nation today, let's be greatly reassured by God's promises, which he always keeps. Let's fix our eyes on him and encourage one another to stand firm. And if we are confident in our faith, we will find it easier to hold out his light to others. We may find this easier at Christmas when it's more acceptable to talk about the hope that we have and to invite friends to carol services. Even the mainstream airwaves are proclaiming the true meaning of the baby's birth this year in the catchy chorus of, of Sir Cliff Richard's new single, Christ has come to save the world, Jesus, the heart of Christmas. What hope does this truth offer to our neighbours who are struggling? In the wood of the manger and the wise men's gift of myrrh, we see the shadow of the cross. It's hard to lift our eyes to eternity when we are bogged down in our present troubles. Faith in Christ does not pay the bills, but his purpose in coming tells us that we are each enormously significant to God. And his love for us was shown in action, both as the baby in Bethlehem and as the man at Golgotha. We are therefore called to be his hands and feet in serving our neighbours in their needs. The proclamation of the gospel and our treatment of those around us are intrinsically linked. And because we know that we are loved and secured for eternity, we can afford to care generously for those around us. So let's point to Jesus in our communities this Christmas. Let's help out in practical ways, providing the food banks, the warm spaces, the listening ear. And let's offer this hope to our neighbours. If you get a shiver down your spine at the sparkle and magic of Christmas, at the candlelight and carols in your local church, 
how much more will you thrill when you realize his hand is on the whole of history that at Christmas and Easter, he acted for you. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. And so too our guest this week, Cara Bentley, formerly of this parish. Welcome back. How are you? Hi, Tim. I'm really good. How are you? I'm all right. It's wonderful to have you back to Cara, a now broadcast journalist for News UK, joining us to talk about the year we've just had, which is, you know, fairly uneventful, but we'll see if we can fill a few minutes talking about it. But let's start off by talking about your profession and what you do. Uh, we talk about this being a mucky business, politics. To what extent is journalism a mucky business and how did you as a, a Christian end up in it? Uh, it, it can be a mucky business. I think I approached it from the performance side of things. So I was very into theatre and the use of the voice and singing and that sort of thing. And then became interested in the news when I was a teenager and politics and elections. And I thought election coverage is absolutely amazing. This is better than any Marvel film, although my brother would probably disagree. And uh, yeah, I guess after a while I started volunteering in radio was absolutely obsessed with Radio 1, wrote down the top 40 every week. And then gradually that became, I guess, the predominant interest after church um, over my academic studies and then uh, became my academic studies. So I did a master's in broadcast journalism and then started working for Premier. Wonderful. Well, let's have a, a quick think about the year just gone. In, in, in my in my mind, I've just a, a few thoughts of the things that have happened. So we began... 2022 with Partygate rumbling on uh, quite enthusiastically in all the news bulletins. Then we had the appalling invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the nuclear threat that goes along with that, the refugee situation that the UK in part responded to, the impact that's had on energy bills and inflation and the cost of living. We saw the Prime Minister eventually going um, late spring, early summer, largely because he had appointed Christopher Pincher, because uh, despite a uh, past uh, reputation for sexual harassment or what have you, he then had the long summer, summer without any kind of government at all. And then Liz Truss is elected. Then the Queen passes away very shortly after then. Uh, of course, then there's the Liz Truss quasi quartet budget. The Conservatives tank in the polls. Liz Truss has got rid of. Rishi Sunak comes in. Oh, now then. So what do you pick out of that? What What's the craziest headline that you read out this week that you couldn't believe, or this year, that you could hardly believe that you had to read out? Mm. I think one of the craziest days was actually, well, there were probably two. One was when the day before Boris Johnson resigned, when uh, everyone was handing in their letters and I was reading the news on Times Radio every half an hour and every half hour there was about another eight letters in and you're trying to keep on top of Twitter and who's posted the letter and how senior they were and how close they were to Boris Johnson before and it was just manic trying to keep on top of those numbers and and work out whether he was going to resign today or tomorrow and then again when Liz Truss resigned I think because Boris Johnson hung on so long, you kind of thought maybe Liz Truss might do the same, maybe she'll be mm -hmm. as stubborn as he appeared. Um, but then when she suddenly, well, when MPs suddenly kind of started voicing their uh, discontent behind the scenes, that was also one of the craziest days when it kind of, when the penny dropped that she was actually going to resign that day. That was mm -hmm. also crazy. The day, uh, the day that the Queen actually died, I wasn't reading the news, although I was working, but the next day, I went to Buckingham Palace at 5 a.m. in the morning. And I mean, obviously that was just a weird day. You think she literally died yesterday and mm -hmm. and now the palace is empty and it's dark and it was vigil-like and there were candles and flowers and people dropping off flowers on their way to work, just on their commute. Um, and then later in the day when I was still there about 1 p.m. and it was absolutely heaving. And you just think of all the organization that went into those very immediate things, even the the service within hours of of her dying and and that's the queen dying is one of those things that in newsrooms is kind of a synonym for biggest story ever and mm. so when it actually happens and you all pull together even though you've planned it you know working it all out is still kind of surreal what what kind of impact do you think we're now um three months on from the queen's passing although it seems in some ways so much longer ago what impact do you think that's had on society since and on on politics obviously seeing the harry and Meghan stuff now all over the news do you think that it's unsettled as at all as a country 
I don't think it in itself or on its own has unsettled us, but I think along with everything else, it's fallen into a year that has been very unsettling. Mm. So I think the war in Ukraine has kind of physically and practically unsettled us as a country a lot more. The economic crisis that it's caused. I remember someone saying as early as February, you know, this is going to affect Weetabix and digestive biscuits. And I kind of thought, really? But now it's affected so much more than that. And the energy crisis and the cost of living crisis and all of that is um, a lot more pronounced and profound, I would say, than, than the death of the Queen. But I think the fact that that has fallen in such a tough year uh, before all these strikes as well has probably added to people's sense of instability. After two years of incredible instability already uh, when people really wanted a bit of stability for once. So I think it's been, I think it just added to that feeling of where are we going? Mm. I mean, what do you think Christians can say to non-Christian friends and family members about this? Because I, I, I absolutely do sense this feeling that uh, we're in unprecedented chaos. How, how can we speak into these sort of circumstances? Mm. Well, you asked at the beginning, we'll see that, you know, how is, is journalism lucky business? And I think that when you're a Christian in the newsroom, you have to remember that Jesus is on the throne, that God is sovereign, um, that everything is uh, under his hand. And a bit like a doctor or a nurse, they see tragedy every day and they might not become immune to it, but they do become used to it and uh, able to deal with the professional side of it. And that's how we kind of deal with it in the newsroom is, OK, I've, I've heard this tragedy and I now need to write it down and tell someone about it kind of thing. And you don't become unaffected, but you you do have to remember that people and the world are fallen. And that's the approach we come to the world and the news with as Christians is I know the world is fallen and I know that it's cursed and I know that people are sinful and people are fallen. And I think when you come in with that perspective, it's not negative, it's just truthful. That's the biblical perspective. And when you approach politics and uh, natural disasters in that way, they don't surprise you. They don't shake your faith. They, you, just, you just remember that heaven is not going to have any of these. We're going to have perfect bodies. We're going to live forever. We're going to be with Jesus and it, and it literally will all be perfect. So I think remembering that when you see the news is this isn't how it's meant to be. This isn't Eden and it's not the new creation is so important. And I think for Christian journalists, we have a duty to be proportionate, accurate and fair. So I think it's very easy for Christian journalists to kind of band around the truth at all costs principle i.e our job as christian journalists is to expose truth wherever truth needs to be exposed but if you pursue that to the nth degree then it kind of becomes ridiculous you don't i don't believe that you need to know about a celebrity having an affair or an an mp having liposuction unless they've expensed it or something um i don't think truth exposing for truth's sake necessarily glorifies god um, unless you are actually exposing a sin that needs to be exposed and uh, because, you know, the church is crumbling otherwise. Um, but if you go through the principles of is this proportionate, is this accurate, is it fair, it doesn't have to be kind, but is it fair, then I think that helps you write it in, in a way that even if it's a negative story about someone, in a way that can glorify God if you think it is in the public interest and people do need to know. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. We're talking to Cara Bentley, broadcast journalist of News UK. Um, Cara, proportionate, accurate and fair being guiding principles for a Christian in the media and in journalism. Looking at the story that was all over the news right at the beginning of the year and ultimately led to the Prime Minister's demise, Partygate, um, to what extent do you think the coverage of Boris Johnson's uh, uh, behaviour, shall we say, in number 10 during the pandemic was proportionate, accurate and fair? Mm. I think the first thing to say is it was fair to cover it. There were people who were saying, oh, who cares? He had a couple of sandwiches, whatever. He was ambushed by cake. It really doesn't matter. But I think even if you don't think it matters, 
it was the law at the time and he wrote those laws and everything everyone said at the time you know you can't break your own laws and and even if he didn't you need to find out whether the prime minister did so i think it is fair and it is proportionate to investigate our leaders about whether they practicing what they preach um we are journalists are one sector of society which hold politicians accountable um as well as many others uh, the electorate being the most important one, but we are one of them and we have the resources to investigate these things. And I think that most of the time uh, when it's in the public interest, we should. So I think it was, I think it was fair. Um, was the coverage always fair? I think probably it, it mostly was. It lent on the side of yes, being fair. Um, because we also were covering the fact that there was an inquiry, there was the Sue Gray report. So it wasn't just journalists looking into it, we were reporting mm. what other senior civil servants were doing. So if they thought it was fair to investigate, it was fair to us to report their investigation, if that makes sense. Mm. And I wonder whether to the extent to which people might say it was disproportionate was because the coverage went on for so long, because it took so long for him to take responsibility. Um, interesting contrast. Uh, so. I guess Boris Johnson's the charge against him was around integrity and it took six, seven months for him eventually to be forced to resign. The charge to Liz Trust, I would suggest, was actually about competence and it took only a few weeks or even days for her to be pushed over the edge. Does that mean that we, we value competence over integrity? <laughs> Good question. I think it means that they were different characters, to be honest. I think if Boris Johnson had done a budget that was that shocking, I think he still would have lasted for six, seven months after it happened, mm -hmm. even with all the hoo-ha being exactly the same. I think it comes down to character and how much you love being at the top of your game and the centre of the spotlight. And I'm sure he would say that that is accurate of himself. Um, I think... In some ways, although it was disruptive, Liz Trust resigning did show an element of integrity, which her predecessor lacked. And in some ways, you, that is good, that democracy was kind of at work there. Although people didn't vote her out, it was quite a vocal opposition across the country. Um, and it also, that plays into another thing about how you report something. We're not allowed, especially on the broadcast side of things, to say, to put in descriptives or to put in it to, words that influence people. You know, Liz Truss has finally resigned after an awful budget. We <laughs> have to say Liz Truss has said she's apologised for a budget which she says was the right idea at the wrong time. Labour has said, on the other hand, X, Y and Z. Mm. Um, so I think as long as you're reporting it fairly, um, then you're you're doing your listeners or your, your readers um, justice in that sense. You're yeah. being fair to them. But yes, I think different characters maybe rather than different circumstances. I think that's right. Now, we talked about what were the craziest thing you read out this year. What, what would you say is the most significant news event of the year? There's a lot to choose from. I do think the war in Ukraine because of its huge financial implications here in terms of food production and supermarket shelves and energy costs and i know that the government are trying to deal with that in all in all various ways with the energy scheme etc but that is huge and it's not just huge here so i think that's why we're such a global world and we're not just an island and we are we do still have a close relationship with the eu and it's just affected everything and let alone the people who've come here as well mm -hmm. you know that will impact us hugely in the future because we have so many ukrainians in the country now and so many very sadly becoming homeless now that the homes for ukraine scheme is coming to an end for many of them and the hosts are saying well i've got my own heating bills to pay for and the government aren't chipping in anymore mm. i can't afford to keep this couple or this family anymore either so i think that will be huge and i think they will influence our culture over time as well which will be brilliant and but there'll be so many hardships, obviously, for people until it's until it's solved, until until Putin leaves. Well, Cara, as we, as we wrap up our time, let's finish by asking you what we can pray for you. Oh, thanks. Um, 
I think praying for me and all Christian journalists to be a good witness, to keep kind of being firm and clear on acting like a Christian in the workplace. Um, there's that, you know, those verses in Philippians about focusing on what's pure and what's good and what's holy. Um, I think it's good to be doing that in the work that we put out to the world, but also in how we conduct ourselves in the office, um, not speaking badly of people and gossiping and all those kind of tips that Paul's, Paul gives in his letters um, about how we conduct ourselves in everyone's job. Um, but also doing that in a bulletin. How do you be fair to someone? Um, how do you be fair to someone who's made a huge error? How do you be fair to someone who's made a huge error without being unkind, but with being truthful? How do you cover a story that you find uh, difficult? All those things. So I think uh, conducting ourselves as much as we can with purity and kindness and uh, proportionateness um, is, would be my prayer. Karen, thanks ever so much. Um, we, you, we're really blessed to have you back on. Thanks ever so much for what you do and for giving us your time. Have a wonderful Christmas. I hope you get some decent time off. Thanks, Tim. You too. Each week, we give you the opportunity for you to ask any question you'd like about this mucky business of politics. It may be how an aspect of this world impacts us Christians who work within it, or maybe there's a particular issue that you're struggling to make sense of. Well, I'd love to hear from you and attempt an answer. So please drop me an email to farron at premier.org.uk. Well, this week, Matthew in Bristol sent over this question. Tim, what does an MP do over Christmas? Are you able to switch off? And how can we pray for our MPs when they're on holiday? What a lovely question, Matthew. I'm very grateful for it. Uh, di different MPs do different things. Uh, we take the view, certainly in my office, that we will close the office for a week or so over Christmas um, with one or two folks keeping a an ear on the answer machine and an eye on the inbox just in case severe emergencies like somebody may, being made homeless might take place. But otherwise, I'm going to try and spend a week, maybe even two, at home with my family, um, not doing anything very spectacular other than watching Home Alone several times over and uh, going to church, going for walks with my family and probably going to watch Blackburn Rovers disappoint me once again uh, during the festive period. Uh, but it is a time to be able to switch off. And certainly a prayer for me would be that I that I would and I'd be able to. But also it's a time when you can be a witness around those loved ones of yours who are not believers. So I guess for me and perhaps for other Christian MPs over this holiday time, peace, genuine peace, recharging batteries, focusing upon the genuine meaning of, of Christmas, of, of God coming into this world and redeeming it through his son, Jesus. Um, but also when we are placed in our families, what an opportunity it is when we're close together for a long period of time to share the gospel. Pray that we get opportunities and we take them. If you have a question for Tim, email farron at premier.org.uk. Well, let's end our time together in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this year. We thank you for your provision this year and your hand upon all of the events of this world, that you are in control, you are on the throne, no matter how things seem. We thank you for the Christians that you place in every part of our society. We thank you today for those working in journalism. Thank you for Cara and for Marcus, who helps to produce this show. We thank you for what they do. We pray for Christians in journalism, that you'd help them to be powerful witnesses, that they would be proportionate, accurate and fair in their reporting, and that they would honour you in their workplace. Lord, we pray for all of us who are Christians in public life, that you'd help us to focus upon you, Lord Jesus, that we would focus on what is pure, good and holy, uh, and that we would have hands that serve you and those you've given us to serve. Lord, as we approach Christmas, we're really so grateful to you uh, that you sent your son Jesus to earth to redeem us, to redeem this broken world and to give us genuine hope. Uh, Lord, we thank you that even in these times, um, secular times in this country, uh, that nevertheless, it's kind of OK and acceptable to talk about uh, you, Lord Jesus, at this time of year. Let us not waste that opportunity. Give us chances, we pray, opportunities to share the gospel and help us to be wise in how we do so. And we pray that many would be blessed uh, by receiving you for the first time into their hearts this Christmas time. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us for this week's show. Don't forget, you can catch up on past episodes which feature interviews with party leaders, former government ministers and MPs from all the major parties. Just search for A Mucky Business on your chosen podcast provider or head to premierchristianradio.com forward slash A Mucky Business. Happy Christmas.